what he found was the real thing. His radar locked onto a new target. Now everyone else had to know. You know, people use the phrase born again, and it's sort of a cliche, but Keith felt like everything started new that night. I've never seen such a radical transformation in any human being as much as I saw in Keith. He had finally found truth that he'd been searching for in his songs, that he'd been trying to get from his family and from the world around him. He, he, his hunger seemed more profound than, than most of ours. Instead of songs about searching and what's it all about and where am I going, what's my life mean, they became songs of I know God, here he is, and it just reshaped everything. The only thing it didn't reshape immediately was his audience. Many of the loyal fans who had been so attracted to his spiritual searchings were now offended by his claim to have found an answer. The usual crowd at the Blah did not know how to react. This is when Keith was on stage talking about how Jesus had changed his life. He thought, look, the church has enough music. They don't need, any, they don't need my music. They've got plenty of music. I want to go out and sing to people who are searching just like I was. His songs had to do with spiritual things, but never like this night. He was always sort of an evangelist in one way or another with whatever it was, and now he became like just super evangelist. So after the first set, I walked out. I thought, forget this. And he followed me out, and he said, you know, what's wrong? And I said, I can't believe that you use this like a church. I was just, you know, so we walked around the whole block and he, you know, told me about how Jesus changed his life and I told him I didn't want my life changed. His motives were good, but there was no tempering. I mean, we were like two weeks old in the Lord. That was the beginning of what I used to call Bible study battles because it went on for about two and a half years. My process of conversion, I think, was over that course of those couple of years from when he became a Christian in 75 to when I became a Christian in 77. Keith's intense personality and immaturity as a believer were a volatile combination. He realized he was offending people for the wrong reasons. Lord, he wrote in his journal, change me, get rid of my radical tendencies, help me control my overwhelming enthusiasm. People get wary if I go off the deep end instead of showing them I care. And I watched this guy just take this fast track. And he finally found the truth. So he wanted everybody to know what he'd found, and he came on heavy. It was a wonderful thing, and then some, quite often it could give you an excedrin headache. And he even you know, went back to Randy, who had initially invited us to the Bible study, and started telling Randy how, well, you need to live your life like this, and the Bible says this. He'd want to say, look, man, you know, why don't you, you know, live what you believe? You know, I'm going, I'm trying, I'm trying. It's not easy being human, you know. I'm glad it's better for you. And there were times when I want to say, Keith, you know, they made duct tape in rock and roll for a good reason. And one of them is to put this on your mouth. They had some arguments, too, that um, I go, oh, no, they're fighting again. I know you mean well, but look, put this on your mouth, go to your prayer closet, and come back and talk to me in about three years, okay? Because I love you, but I just want to throttle you, you know? And then I would look, and I would see Mel, the sweet... You don't get a lot of true friends in life. People that see you're good, see you're not so good, and stick with you. And Randy was that kind of friend to Keith, and he's been that kind of friend to me for years. As a young believer trying to imitate Christ, Keith's forceful manner began to collide head-on with his desire to serve others. It was kind of just like a bull in a china closet. He didn't, he didn't, it was, the heart was perfect, but the actions were bad. He was indulgent one minute and then ruthless on himself the next. And that's a difficult temperament to, to live with. That's like riding rapids in your own emotions. People would get very angry because he was the head of the line wherever there was a line. His zeal quite often got ahead of his own emotional and spiritual maturity. Keith's friends knew that he was sometimes abrasive, but always genuine. He took the gospel seriously and had the audacity to try to put the teachings of Christ into practice. If that meant life had to become messy, then so be it. Cause he sends people to your door And you turn them away As you smile and say God bless you, be at peace And all heaven just weep Cause Jesus
Jesus came to your door You left him out on the streets Just in the normal course of life, wherever we went, you know, we were witnessing to people. And when we found people with needs, you know, Keith started saying, well, here's a pregnant girl. She doesn't know what to do. Let's bring her home with us. And here's this guy we picked up hitchhiking. He doesn't have a place. Let's bring him home. And our, our house just started to fill up with people that we, just as a young married couple, were trying to help. In my heart of hearts, I only want to serve, Keith wrote in his journal, to present the babes as mature men and women of God. I want more than anything to pour myself out for them, for Jesus. And he'd win them to Christ on the street, and they'd come live with him because they didn't have any place else to go. A lot of them were runaways. You know, there he was trying to have Bible studies and to help these people. It was kind of a mid-70s version of a 60s hippie commune. Keith was progressively surrendering more of his life to God, but his music career remained a huge question mark. Keith had banged on every door in Hollywood to try and get a deal. All he had to do is whisper in the valley that he was going to be somewhere, and it would just jam. He's ready to go out there with Elton John and all those people. The same kind of craft, same kind of skill, charismatic, powerful. And I sat with him through a lot of editions. You just go in and sit right there, play for the record company executives, and they're either you know thumbs up, thumbs down. I couldn't understand why he wasn't getting thumbs up. He didn't need drums, guitars, backup singers. He just blew you away with he and the piano. And the last big audition that he had was with Clive Davis, who was in New York. And, and they flew him out from California. And he thought, this is it. You know, I mean, Clive Davis, I'm at the top right now. He went in, auditioned for him. He called me up. He said, it didn't go well. That was the defining moment. He had a whole pop music career plan, but God had told him he was supposed to be in the ministry. He'd been wrestling now for a while. Does God want me to sing and make song albums for Christians, or does he want me to continue trying to go out and sing to the world? He didn't really want to do it. He'd been groomed to be a star. And when he wasn't signed, he just said, well, I'm going to do a Christian album then. He's brought me love so I could know the way to reach the I said, what do I have to do to sign you to Sparrow Records? For Keith, it was like the end of a lifelong quest. You really belong on Sparrow. He says, probably so. That's where my friends are, and I know the kind of thing you're doing, and uh, I'd really like to be on Sparrow. He viewed at that time that Christians and that Christian music per se as well it was going to be really low budget you know it won't sound that well and and not that many people are really going to be able to hear the message of my heart so I sat there and worked out a contract with Keith on the back of a napkin once Keith realized that that was God's will he you know he got very excited about it and really wanted to do it I mean he knew it was God so Keith signed with Sparrow even though he was offered I think more money for some other people he, he was very good of course, little did we know at that point that, you know, God would use it the way that he did. As Keith embraced the new path that was opening for him, he found unexpected freedom and a sense of calling. It was a time of intense chemistry and creativity. Our house was really just this hub of musical energy. Everybody was writing. So Todd came over one day with, you know, and showing each other what, do you do, what are you working on. So Todd had this song and played it for Keith. Keith loved the chorus, Your Love Broke Through. I mean, he loved the music to it. And um, said, let's keep the chorus, we need another verse. And the phone rings, and I pick it up, and it's Keith. And he's going, Randy, um, Todd Fishkin came by w with this beautiful chorus melody, and, and I've been working on the verse melody, uh, and you just got to come over and, and write the lyrics. Uh, God just told me that you're, you're the guy, and, and he's just going to do wonderful things with this song, and you got to come over right now. And at this point, I was just like holding the phone away, <laughs> going, it's Keith. A really short time after that, Randy dropped in. As I drove up into the driveway, I could already hear him 
all the, in the music room was down the hall and sort of like it, 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 toward the back of their house. So Keith sat down and played it for Randy. He just said, Randy, Randy, okay, okay, l l listen to this, listen to this. Uh, okay, oh, this is going to be wonderful. Okay, so, so, so what do you think? 